Hi, uh, welcome to, for many classes, this will be your first video. Uh, for other classes, you might see this video a little bit later. Um, this is me up here in the, in the corner there, Dr. Selby. Um, uh, currently, I'm teaching at CSU Sacramento and Folsom Lake College. It looks like it's going to be that way for a while. Today, uh, the lecture is on what is science, okay? It's a course in political science, um, and that means obviously wrapping our brains around just some of the basics of how science works, where it came from, that's going to be very important to us. Our agenda here is pretty straightforward. I'm going to talk first about the historical origins of science, then I'm going to talk about the different parts of science, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about the practice of science, okay? There's a lot to cover. It'll take me probably about an hour. Um, sorry for the little glare. Uh, today is the day that the um, atmospheric river came through and I lost power. So I'm actually just recording this on battery power on my computer. I think I have enough for one take only. So hopefully this is going to make it through on one take. Um, um, and we'll just, we'll just go from there. So let me just jump right into it. And let's start talking about the historical origins of science. So where did science come from? What were they responding to? This is what I this is what I want to talk about first. So, where did science come from? Well, science started in early modern Europe. That's roughly say fourteen hundred. Well, that's it's a bit later in this case. Say fifteen hundred to about seventeen hundred is the main sort of like. There's a bunch of guys. There's some that's actually actually happening about fourteen hundreds. You're getting uh, some uh, forerunners and stuff. But uh, right around the mid 16th century, you start getting people like Francis Bacon, and you get Copernicus and Galileo. And, you know, honestly, even the Ninja Turtles, the Leonardo's, and all those guys, um, they were doing a lot of engineering. They weren't quite scientists yet, but they were quite innovative. And they were really setting the groundwork for what becomes systematized into science. That's why kind of, you know, 1400. But, these are long time frames. The exact dates are a little bit fuzzy, but you know, this is like the meat of the action is happening in these 200 years where science is really growing, becoming systematized and developed. But what are these early scientists? So like I said, it was people like Bacon, Galileo, um, even if you're in my political theory class, John Locke, who's right at the end of this, he dies in 1720, 1721, something like that. Um, but Locke was very important in he was kind of a second generation scientist. He had Bacon and some of these other guys to look back to. But, you know, these are big names in the history of Western thought. And so this period, we call it the scientific revolution because science is being systematized. We start to use it, um, you know, make awesome new stuff, right? Science is you know, it's great. Computers are great, right? We all love computers and phones. And we don't have any of that without science, okay? Um, what are they really responding to, though? Well, people, especially here like Bacon, They're responding to, first, the challenge of absolute skepticism. At this period in Europe, there's also a bunch of religious wars, and one of the most uh, uh, common, strongest philosophical schools was this absolute skepticism school of someone like Michel de Montaigne. Um, you know, really interesting guy. I actually really enjoyed his philosophy. But, you know, he said, he said, no truth is certain. There's no such thing as certainty. All, everything is doubt. You can't know anything. Okay. Um, and the scientists, people like Bacon and others, they were really moved by this. I mean, Montaigne's a great philosopher. Um, he's very persuasive. But what they did is they said, okay, Montaigne, you know, challenge accepted. That there is a real incertitude, that's the word that Montaigne used, incertainty or incertitude, to knowledge. But, ah, but if we do it right, we might be able to make some claims about the world that we can be more or less um, uh, uh, certain of, okay? One of the things that's important here to keep in mind is that this response, scientists are still skeptical, the role of doubt. And that's what skepticism is. It's a focus on doubt. The role of doubt remains terribly important in science. 
all of science is probabilistic. Okay, we're pretty sure we know this. Now, sometimes those probabilities are 99.9 .9 or something like that, right? Um, evolution, for example, great theory, you know, but you know what? Any scientist is still going to hold up the possibility of a better theory that will come along to explain that phenomenon. So like, for example, Newtonian physics, which is also developed, I should put Newton on here, Newtonian physics is developed right in this time frame. That was the way of thinking about physics for like 300 years. And then Einstein comes along, he's like, nope, knocks it all over. Okay. And now we're like, oh, Einstein. But people are like, well, there's some problems. Maybe we can fix relativity or come up with another theory that actually even explains it even better. Okay. So things might seem like we're 100% certain. And 200 years later, sometimes the time frame is long here. 200 years later, we come back and we say, oh, okay, you know, yeah, uh, that worked pretty good but here's a theory that works even better, okay? Um, oh, there it is. I got my handy dandy cleaner offer here. Um, the second challenge that these guys were responding to, which I don't wanna talk about as much, because it's not quite as philosophically interesting, um, was the challenge of the church. And the church had uh, answers from the Bible. So, you know, Earth is the center of the solar system. Why? Because humans are here, right? Well, that's Copernicus and Galileo, they're like, no, dude, <laughs> like, I just got some observations to show you that, ah, uh, show you that, um, you know, I can see that we're going around the sun, not that the sun's going around us. And like, that's, you know, oh no, you're excommunicated, okay? So um, the historical origins of science are really important, very interesting. Science was challenged by skepticism, and what it did was it kind of incorporated a lot of the skeptical attitude um, into the practice of science. Now let's talk about the parts of science. There's three parts of science. Each of these three parts of science is terribly important, okay? And interesting, scientists kind of debate which of these is more important, um, but interestingly, they're all important. And truthfully, you can begin at kind of like any of these, but all science has some of these. So I'll talk as I keep going, you'll kind of see what I mean. But let's start by doing some definitions. What is theory? Theory are large, rational descriptions um, uh, Oh, I forgot to um, give our preliminary definition. Forgot to give the preliminary definition of science, but that's okay, we'll get back to it. So theories are large rational descriptions that connect cause and effect, okay? So we're looking at the material world in some sense. Um, we want to know why things are happening. That means we're concerned about cause and effect you know, think chemistry here, how do different molecules bond together, things like that, right? What's causing that? Well, it's electrons and, you know, positives, negatives and all that, okay? Method. Method is a way of doing research, or what we would say of gathering observations, okay? There's lots of different methods. Like, we, our brains are kind of primed to think in terms of sort of like chemistry or lab. You're in a lab, you got your coat, you're experimenting and tinkering with things, you keep notes, you kind of see what happens. Of course, that type of experimental method is incredibly important um, in science. But, you know, lots of other methods exist, too, especially in the social sciences. We do interview methods, we do statistical methods, we do formal models. Um, there's other types of things that we do. Um, so, you know, method, and like, think about this. Maybe you're a biologist and you study trees. You can't, a tree that takes 100 years to grow, you can't grow that in a lab, you're going to be dead, right? So where do you get your observations? You go out into nature and you walk around 
and you take notes and do it that way. And that's another type of observational method that's very common in some of the more natural sciences, especially biology and stuff like that. I mean, that's all Darwin did when he came up with evolution. He sailed around the world, took notes on the animals, and he goes, wow, a lot of these animals look similar, but then there's some differences. You know, they seem to be connected. How can I explain how these things are connected together? Okay. Not like hung up on evolution. It's just a theory that like we're relatively, you know, familiar with. And then lastly, observation, which is maybe the key part of science, to be quite honest, because what distinguishes science from philosophy, what distinguishes science from religion, right? Remember the, the church was the other thing, is that we use observations as the basis of our knowledge. To confirm or disconfirm our theories. Okay? That's what makes science special, this piece here, okay? We call this empiricism, which is a really important word. Empiricism means making judgments based upon observation of what we see in the real world, okay? Um, so, you know, Einstein, when he came up with his theory, what was so interesting about it was it solved a lot of the problems that Newtonian physics couldn't. So, as I said earlier, you know, there's a couple hundred years going by, you know, Newtonian physics worked really well for most things, but then there was these problems that were coming up and researchers were going, you know, how do we make sense of this? Well, Einstein comes up with his new theory, he articulates it, but there's no way to study it yet. But people saw the intuitive power of it and they said, okay, if we're thinking this way, let's try to come up with some methods in order to gather some observations. And it took actually a few years and then they started going, oh, okay, we can do this. Oh, look, it looks like this is, is what Einstein would have predicted. And even today, we're still working out trying to find ways to test certain of Einstein's um, hypotheses because that's just how complicated it is. It's really hard to figure that out. And, you know, I kind of follow some pop physics. I'm not like a hardcore, I'm not hardcore to physics. I was not a physics major. You know, I'm not going deep on Einstein. But, you know, every year or so, it's like, oh, we just found another way to test one of Einstein's predictions, and it looks like he was right, right? Now, Einstein's not perfect either. So, like, with relativity, there's also quantum mechanics, and there's string theory. There's, like, lots of different competing theories, which is cool and important. Now, what I forgot to do is like, oh, I forgot to do it, but I got to kind of power through is we need to have a definition of what is science. So I want you to write this definition in now of what is science. This is a really important definition. Again, it kind of brings all of science together for us, whether it's physics or social sciences or whatever. Attempt to explain natural or social phenomena. Okay, that's it. It's the attempt to explain natural or social phenomena. Okay, so natural, the natural sciences, something called the physical sciences, that's physics, chemistry, biology, you know, usually sometimes they're referred to as like the hard sciences. Um, social sciences, economics, political science, sociology, um, anthropology, psychology, um, there's a few others, right? I'm not doing a comprehensive list, but no matter what scientific field you're working in, you're working with all three of these parts. You're working with theories, you're working with methods, and you're working with observations, okay? And they're all, they're all really important. And scientific innovation are, we're primed to think, oh, you know, it's like Einstein, that's the Einstein story, new theory, bam, let's do it. But the Einstein story doesn't actually start with, his, with, with, with theory. The Einstein story starts with observation of the failure of Newtonian physics to fit what we're seeing all the time in the world. Did a really good job for a lot of stuff, and then there was problems, right? If it explained everything, we would, Einstein wouldn't have had grounds to look for a new theory. Oftentimes, scientific innovation actually begins with methods as well, right? So, you know, here, think Galileo Copernicus. You come up with a telescope. You look out into the sky and then you can gather a new observation and your new observation then reflects onto a theory. 
the theory that the sun was the center of the universe had actually been around forever. It was just Catholic Church was saying it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. You get that new method, the method leads to an observation that then tells us which theory is right. Very interesting stuff here. Um, and tons of innovations on the on the method side, like super important, like happens all the time, especially in political science or the social sciences. Lots of times new methods have been really revolutionary for us. So that's the sort of basics of the three main things of science. But I want to hit a couple of other. Those are the main parts. I want to kind of hit some important pieces about um uh sort of build on build on 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 that um and i talked about empiricism right you should now also know these two things are really important to us skepticism and rationalism and that's one of the things that, again, why science is so important. Skepticism, because we're never 100% sure, always hold possibility of a better explanation. Okay. And rationalism, why rationalism? Because our theories need to be consistent, logically consistent, right? Um, so rationalism is really important for how we put together our theories. A causes B causes C, whatever, something like that, okay? But rationalism is super important on the theory building side, right? Skepticism, rationalism, and then never forget empiricism which we use to judge our theories okay so it's you know it's almost like not, these are just three sort of important philosophical attitudes um, in science okay skepticism always keeping doubt in mind rationalism making logically coherent explanations and then empiricism empiricism how we're going to test those explanations I already talked about empiricism right one other thing I want, a couple of the little things I want to talk about in science. Important kind of definitional things to help us. First, I want to talk about this idea we call multi-causality. Multi-causality is just a simple idea that in any phenomenon, there are lots of causal factors, okay? So, you know, you know you're looking at the rotation of the, 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 the movement of planets, right? You're looking at those kinds of things. You know, there's actually lots of things that are going into explaining why planets uh, revolve around the sun the way that they do, okay? So we wanna keep that in mind. Or maybe in a social science explanation, we might look at, say, voting behavior. But when you look at voting behavior, there's all kinds of things that matter when explaining voting behavior, right? It's not just male, female. It's not just, um, it's not just um, race. It's not just religion. It's not just geography. It's not just ideology. It's not just how the economy is doing. It's not just individual voters, reflections of how well they think candidates have been doing. Um, it's not just, you know, whatever, it's a long list of things. It's all of those things. We're going to bundle them all in, uh, when we're making explanations. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, as far as how we can sort of like find priority between different factors, different causal factors. But, you know, it, it's, it's the vice of a simple mind to think that everything is simply explained. Explanations are actually quite complicated usually. And there's a lot going on, and we need to engage with that complexity. So multi-causality. I want to give you another important definition for us. Notice I haven't talked about like hypotheses and falsification, right? I mean, you're probably familiar with some of those terms. Falsification is not as common, right? 
are like, oh, you, you have a hypothesis. Well, a hypothesis is just one causal claim derived from a theory, right? So, you know, my theory says this should happen. And you're going to have a hundred of those different hypotheses. I don't want us getting that nitty gritty um, exactly because we're just kind of trying to be a little bit broader in our approach. And uh, scientists and science studies, they fight a lot over exactly the best practice of science. And I'm trying to avoid that fight too. I'm just saying like, look, it doesn't matter where you go. These are, this is what you're going to see. And it's kind of like looking at a family worldwide. Like there's some kind of fundamental, even though there's a lot of variation, there's some kind of fundamental, um, you know, similarity in families, right? There's a dad and a kid and a mom, a mom and a dad. <laughs> there might also be a, another mom and a dad, grandparents who live in the family, you know, or live in the household, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. Next piece that I want to talk about. We're still, oh, see, we're here now in the parts. So I maybe hadn't made that transition as clear, but this is where we're at now. Theoretical pluralism, okay? Having, we usually, the first move most students want to go to when they start sort of like thinking about science and how it works, they want to know which theory is right, right? Well, which theory is right, Professor Selby? Tell me. Uh, if I knew, I would tell you, I promise, okay? Uh, I don't know, and that's okay. That's good, okay? It's actually, um, it's really great to have multiple theories. And one thing that we do when we're talking about trying to use our observations and how well they work with different theories is we'll talk about um, comparing explanations. And what we mean when we say comparing explanations is this theory would explain this phenomena this way, this one would do it that way, which explanation seems to fit with our observations better, okay? Um, but there's no single theory that explains everything, not yet that I have found. So let me give you, again, the example from physics. Here we're going to do modern physics, leave Newton aside for the time being, and then I'll talk about political science theories. And th I'm only talking about two, there's actually more like three, four, five kind of theories, um, but there's two big ones and then kind of some smaller ones. So I don't want to be mean to the smaller ones, but we're not in a grad level class, you know, we're going to keep it kind of, you know, in the real world, not get too, too crazy fancy. But let's talk about physics. So what did Einstein do? The first thing he did was he did the theory of rel relativity, which is a relativity, which is a really good theory. The theory of relativity explains big stuff. Okay. It explains black holes, suns, you know, E equals MC squared, you know, space, matter, time, right? This is, this is the stuff you see mostly in like Star Trek. They're like playing with all this kind of like big stuff. Star Trek dis Discovery is pretty legit, by the way. It's another story, but really good job. But you know what? It doesn't explain everything. It explains 98% roughly of everything. That's a problem, right? And even Einstein knew that. Einstein is like, this doesn't, this is really good theory, but it doesn't get us all the way there. What are we going to do, Einstein? Well, he's a smarty pants, so he actually starts this movement. And then Einstein and others come up with this alternate theory called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics does the small stuff. subatomic particles, you know, all this kind of stuff, okay? And there's like kind of some links, but they're based on very different assumptions. And so we know that the physical world in some sense, it's got to be one thing, at least maybe not, interestingly, that, that, but that's, let's not go too far down. That's now we're going like kind of wacko town, but that actually, you know, there might be multiple realities and maybe that could help us, you know, bring all these things together. But, um, um, you know, leaving that aside, you know, the assumptions underneath theory of relativity are basically opposite from the assumptions of quantum mechanics. And just like um, theory of relativity, quantum mechanics explains about 98% of everything. It explains that 2% that relativity doesn't, plus a bunch more stuff, but there's things that relativity explains that quantum mechanics doesn't. We need both of these theories, okay? At least as far as I can tell. Now, that was 100 years ago, roughly, when Einstein was doing this, this stuff. So almost, almost exactly 
about 90 some. Um, and today, there is a search in physics for a new master theory. They call that string theory, is the going string theory is the strongest competitor right now. Um, but, um, you know, string theory, one of the problems is they haven't figured out how to really test it yet. So it answers a lot of the problems that they have, but uh, physicists aren't quite so sure about string theory because they're like, well, you know, <laughs> let's, we got to find a method to test it. And without a method to gather observations to see if, it, if it's true or not, you know, it, it could just be a great theory that's not actually what's happening. And that happens all the time. Just because something is logical and there's a rational, what we call a causal sequence there, doesn't mean that that, that causal sequence is what's really happening in the world. Um, and that could be the case with string theory. So physicists kind of like fight over this. But, you know, string theory is what? It's a theoretical innovation. So it's not wrong and it's not right, <laughs> right? We made this nice theory. It cover it fixes a lot of the problems that we had in physics, but it's not, you know, we, we gotta we gotta look and try to find some methods to gather some observations to then know um, if if that's gonna be correct. Um, in political science, and you will you will see these two later. I have longer lectures, full lectures on each one of these. But um, as I said, there's more than just these two, but oh man, I've got a little crunch. It's okay. Um, I had to buy this, I bought this myself. So fancy. Um, I found actually students tend to prefer the actual whiteboard lecture to um, the PowerPoints, which is fine with me because it's actually, I do this lecture every semester 10 times, you know, not 10 times, but a bunch of times. Doing the PowerPoint takes me two, three hours. I can just sit here and crank out a lecture and put it up for you guys. It takes me, you know, a little bit like I set up my computer and stuff, but it's an hour and a half, two hours to do a one hour lecture rather than like a half day. It's like four hours to do your PowerPoints and then sit down to record it. Just PowerPoints take forever to make. So theoretical plural, pluralism, let's look at political science now. Okay, there are two main theories. Theory one, especially that we'll look at, we call rational actor, or sometimes they're referred to as institutional theories. Okay, rational actor or institutional theories. They are more fo focused on self-interested behavior and they have strong connections to the field of economics. So um, these types of theories um, have gone back and forth between political science and economics a lot over the last say like 40 years. Um, comes out of um, what was called microeconomics and now they sometimes call it behavioral economics which is kind of an advancement on what was called microeconomics. Um, so, you know, this is not uh, Keynesian versus uh, libertarian or what they call it, Austrian sometimes. This is a completely different way of thinking about economics. It's not macro. Those are macro approaches. Micro is looking at individuals, not in this big context, but how when they have real constraints on information and things like that. So these are great theories. I'll teach you the basics of these theories. Your next lecture is on rational actor, institutional approaches. I have a whole uh, write up on Global ACM about it. They're really amazing, actually. They're very strong and persuasive. And actually, a lot of political scientists these days are winning the Nobel Prize in Econ because they're doing these like rational actor sort of approaches. So Eleanor Ostrom, who's at the University of Washington, last I checked, she was there. Um, really big, important book uh, on what we call um, common pool resource problems. But it's it has political payoffs and it has economic payoffs. She's basically half economist, half political scientist. She won the Nobel Prize about, that's almost like eight years ago now or something like that, it was a while ago. It was in the 10s, she won it in the 10s or now in the 20s, can't believe it's 2021. Um, so there you go, rational actor, institutional. The other type of, 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 um, of uh, approach we will call political sociology. Political sociology, focuses more on culture, okay? And culture definitely matters, right? Like these guys don't really, there's some complicated ways they can get to talking about culture, but you know, political sociologists are like, look, culture matters, sociology, anthropology, um, political science, they all study culture. And um, you know, culture is a real thing. 
you know, it's hard for these guys to talk about culture, but it's a lot easier for these guys. Um, and it comes largely from sociology and also anthropology. And like I said, there are more, there are more uh, uh, ways of doing uh, science in the field of political science. Um, but uh, this covers like most of the ground and it gives us a great language for working through our classes where sometimes we're gonna look at rational actor institutional explanations you know, we're going to look, you know, you're doing three branches of government, right? Well, these types of explanations are really helpful for looking at how politicians behave. These types of, of explanations are actually a little bit better for looking at how individual voters behave. They're better for looking at, this is a little bit more macro, the big stuff, like if we're going to make an analogy with physics here, political sociology would be theory of relativity. It's pretty good at explaining the big stuff. It has a hard time with the small stuff. Rational actor has these tight, nice explanations, narrow, focused in on why did this politician make this decision at this time? Culture has a harder time doing that cultural explanations, but they explain a lot of other stuff that rational actor explanations have a hard time with, okay? So um, remember the three main parts of science, which I then kind of uh, did a couple of like add-ons there. Um, uh, the three main parts of science are uh, theory, method, and observation. And then when we're thinking about these things, we want to always keep multi-causality and theoretical pluralism in mind. We want to engage with them. Those are important type things, okay? Now let me talk a little bit about the practice. So let's go move down our thing, talk about the practice of science, okay? The first thing I want to say about the practice of science It's collective, not an individual thing. We kind of have this heroic scientist mentality sometimes, Galileo, Einstein, you know, like these types of things. Um, um, let's, okay, I'm gonna have to pause. Sorry about that. Like I said, it's the uh, um, atmospheric river. Wife's calling to see how I'm doing. We got no power at home. She wants to know if there's any power yet. The answer is no power yet. Um, I would not be surprised if like in 10 minutes, just like snap, everything goes like, oh, there's power. Let there be light. Okay, um, to recall, this is where we're at, right? For you guys, it's not as much of an interruption as for me. Science, science um, is a collective, not an individual effort, okay? We kind of have this heroic scientist mentality, but like, again, here, think, and occasionally, you know, this does happen occasionally, um, eccentric genius, Nikola Tesla or something like that, maybe. Um, but, you know, um, Thomas Edison, he had a whole workshop and a ton of people helping him. He was number one guy, but he was managing a bunch of different projects and tell, oh, go do this, go do that. He's the most important guy in the room, but that's collective action, not just his individual behavior. Or again, think about Einstein. He comes up with this nice new theory, but then a bunch of physicists, they go, oh yeah, that explains a bunch of stuff. Let's try to figure out how to test it. Well, that's part of the collective part of science, okay? Um, so to emphasize some of this, I wanna hit a couple of extra pieces. Publicity, the principle of publicity. When you do science, you explain to everybody what you did. You don't just show up and say like, this is the truth. That's the authority approach that the church took. I read the Bible, Earth's the center of the universe. Scientists, their method, their theory, their method, and their observations, it's all public. So other people can go build off of it. So anyone who's like, I have secret data that shows X, they're just lying to you. Just keep that in mind. If anyone says I have secret data that shows something, no, they're lying to you and they're being, it's not science. They're violating the principle of publicity. Everything needs to be public. As part of that, oops. Replicability. Other people, and scientists do this sometimes, they're starting to do a better job with it actually than they used to, they will go and take your, read your, they'll read your paper, your paper gets published, they read your paper, they see your theory, they see your method, they go do it for themselves to see if they get the same answer. And this is essential part of science. Remember the role of doubt. Okay, so you say you did it, you say it all worked, let me go try it and see if I get the same answer. And believe it or not, 
in the social sciences right now, there's what we call a replication crisis. Um, we're getting better at it, but um, there's some kind of funny incentives to kind of like try to push, um, especially doing statistical methods where you can kind of tinker with things to sort of like get your results stronger. Um, that, that becomes a big problem for replication and some of that's perfectly allowed, but sometimes you can tinker so much that you just end up sort of like just fixing the numbers, right? So replicability is terribly important um, in science. And um, Reinhardt and Rogoff, there was this big study that was being used about 10, 12 years ago. And, uh, you know, oh, you know, all the politicians are like, oh, look, we have this study that shows this, you know. And then some grad student went and tried to replicate it. He's like, nope doesn't work, can't replicate it. And journals are starting to get better when things come out and so are professors and they're doing more replication of each other's work. And one time I actually like, I'd seen a thing, oh, that's interesting, kind of like say, I use Google Keep, kind of like saved it in my Keep. You know, a year later I have students doing a sort of like little mini research project. I go, oh, you know, I saw this research that relates to this. I'm like trying to find it, I find it. I sent, I pull it up for them in my office hours and there's like a big red sticker, uh, retracted. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, dang, snap, right? What happened? Well, someone went and tried to rep replicate the results and they couldn't replicate the results. And so the original person, sometimes it's just, you know, honest mistake because methods are hard. Um, but the original person, they still got some similar results, but it was like one tenth as strong as the original study. So they, the journal retracted it, kind of like big red. I mean, it was like kind of scary. I'm like, ah, oh, retracted. I'm like, well, and then I like read the explanation. I go, okay, this is interesting. You know, um, um, you know, there's still maybe something there, but it's like way, way smaller than the original authors suggested. So replication, in my opinion, um, um, uh, grad students should be given the task of replicating research from other researchers. So really great um, practice for your own research. And you know kind of the answer you're thinking you're gonna get. You can ask them for their research. The methods are all there for you. You don't have to like think through everything the first time yourself. You're doing somebody else's study. And you learn a lot from that. So, you know, if I was in charge of a department at a R1 university, which I'm never going to be, but if I were, I would say, you know, in our methods courses, we're gonna have everybody replicate one or two articles from um, from a journal that they found. Even my own work, which is quite historical, um, publicity and replicability are still important. I cite all my sources. I say, I went into the archives and I read this and it told me that, and here it is, go check it. <laughs> and you know, maybe there's more out there that I didn't see. I could be proved wrong with other evidence. So history is actually very evidentiary based as well. And the social sciences actually kind of grew out of history, which is kind of interesting. It's like a longer story. Um, so publicity, replicability, um, uh, one of the other really important things um, that science does is it helps to control for bias. Okay. Um, by having an established method, that's publicly agreed to, it helps us control different types of biases that we might see. Let me talk briefly about some key types of biases. So this first one I want to talk about is called confirmation bias. It comes from the field of psychology, okay? Confirmation bias is this. Um, when we want something to be true, we just instrumentally look for evidence and reasons that it is true and anything that uh, could point to the contrary that like maybe what we want to be true isn't true. We cognitively, our brains, we want to discount it and like push it to the side. Okay. So confirmation bias is a, is a massively um, important problem actually. Um, and we really need, this is why we need all these different things to help control for confirmation bias. And one of the main things in science is, um, is we just kind of, we have a theory, we think it's right. We just want our theory to be right. Cause like, that's awesome when you're right. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but you know, it can happen. You want to prove it happens in econ a lot that they have a, 
economic philosophy and the numbers don't really match as much. And so they start wiggling with it to try to make the numbers match what they want. That happens for conservatives and liberals in economics. It's a real problem, actually. Econ, econ does not do a great job on re replicability. Um, they think, that, you know, it's like there's this kind of like, oh, econ is like this tough, like manly kind of thing or something. But the truth is they don't do a great job on replicability. And a lot of economists have serious confirmation bias problems. Um, econ doesn't do enough observationalism these days. It's getting better. It's coming back to some of its observationalist roots, but it went very theoretical for a while. And theory is fine, but it's just a thing on a page until you can prove it in the real world. So, you know, econ's like, ooh, careful guys. Although again, this rational actor stuff is really big in econ. They do a really good job. Behavioral economists do a really good job. Um, so it's not universal. Psychology has a lot of problems here, um, controlling for bias and confirmation bias. I'm only gonna do three. There's maybe a hundred different types of bias, okay? I'm just doing three really key ones to kind of wrap your brains around how the practice of science is gonna help with this. Oh, last note on confirmation bias. It's not all bad. Confirmation bias is one of the things that um, helps human relationships work well. So in your love relationships with your partners, wives, you know, stuff like that, you really love your, your wife or your husband, that emotion of love filters the information coming in. And when they do things you don't like, you push it to the side, you discount it. And then when they do things you like, they're like, oh, they're so amazing, you know? So like, I don't know, just take, be like super, you know, kind of semi stereotype people. Like, he likes to drink beer and watch football every Sunday with his boys. It's a little bit annoying, but she's like, oh, I love him. It doesn't really matter, right? You know, something like that. Um, uh, so that's confirmation bias. Selection bias is one of the most, this is a properly speaking scientific bias. So it doesn't relate to our brains and how our brains process information. Instead, it relates to the actual methods and, and, and what you're doing. Um, but selection bias happens anywhere where there's um, a problem with what, how you're observing. Okay? And then we would call it your population. It's a problem with how you're observing. And then you end up getting false results because you didn't look at a complete selection of cases, okay? So if you wanna know, say, um, well, say we're just gonna do a public opinion poll, and this is, so everybody in the whole country, what do they think? But say we only called men. Right? So we're like, oh, well, let's find out what all Americans think about whatever X. And then we only call men. Okay, well, believe it or not, like, welcome to the real world. Men and women, there's some differences in how we process things. And not really process things, just, I don't know if it's cultural. I don't know. I don't know where the difference comes from. I'm not trying to take a stand on this one. But it's quite clear that if you only talk to men, you're, gonna, you're missing part of the game. Now, if you're trying to figure out what do men think about X, then you're fine. If you want to know what does everybody in the world think about X, you're in, or in the United States think about X, then you're in deep trouble. Or maybe you don't call anyone from California or you don't call anyone from Texas, right? These are real problems. So in pub, this is one reason in public opinion polls, you always have a, a margin of error, a plus or minus, because there's a little bit of leeway between how many people they can call, practically speaking, and how we can extrapolate to, from that to what everybody thinks, right? You're gonna make some mistakes in there, so you need to give yourself a little bit of wiggle room, okay? Um, uh, oh, let me give you another example of selection bias. Let's say you wanted to know, and this happens a lot, you wanted to know what makes a country democratic, okay? Why democratic? And then what do you do? You say, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put together, I'm gonna put together a spreadsheet of all the democracies and you list them out in your spreadsheet. You just take all the democracies in the world. That's the wrong way to do it. Why? You're, by only looking at democracies, you're not gonna be able to see if there's maybe some similarities with autocracies, which would be the other, you know, dictatorships, that's our other option. You're not gonna be able to see some of those similarities. So maybe this happens, you go, oh, look. Oh my goodness. I notice that all of the democracies have relatively high levels of economic development. 
it must be the case that economic development causes you to be a political democracy. And then lo and behold, it turns out there's, and you're like, oh, okay, done, yeah, figured it out. And then someone comes along and they say, well, did you know that, um, uh, 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 what's the, well, Germany under Hitler or um, uh, Italy under Mussolini or Argentina, right? Did you know that there are many authoritarian regimes, autocracy, authoritarian, same thing, that are also quite capitalistic and, and highly developed? And you say, oh, no, I didn't know that. They say, well, if economic development causes you to be a democracy, why is it that we have these authoritarian regimes with high development, but they're authoritarian and not democratic? And the answer, oops, maybe this does help, but there's got to be something more. Okay, and there actually is a pretty strong relationship between these two things, but we're not quite sure actually if democracy causes economic development or if economic development causes democracy. Could even be a little bit of each, okay? But there certainly needs to be more to this, to this answer because we also see highly developed autocracies or authoritarian regimes, okay? Or similarly, why you want to look at what, uh, what causes a team to win a championship? Basketball, baseball, it doesn't matter. You only look at World Series winning teams. Oh, great pitching. Well, then a lot of losing teams also had great pitching. So you miss something, right? Turns out you need both hit offense and defense, and that winning teams are usually good on both. They'll be stronger on one because, you know, everybody's stronger on one than the other. And just another one that's kind of like, kind of helpful to like log this into our brain. This is one that political scientists really had to grapple with in the mid part of the, of the century. Um, because we went, wording bias comes up in statistics in, in, in interview methods and in public opinion polls and things like that. And basically the idea here is, you know, if you're going to ask somebody about something, you have to ask in a neutral way that doesn't kind of like ping them with value words to go one way or another. So through the 1950s, a lot of the survey research, it's not very reliable because we weren't wording questions in a neutral and fair manner. Okay. You know, just to take a, this is what, this is what I was using like six years ago, but just to take a, 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 a kind of silly example, you know, if you called someone and you said, how corrupt is Hillary Clinton on a scale of one to five, one, not corrupt at all, five, very corrupt. You're assuming that she's corrupt. You put that into the question, and then that person is going to also assume that that's what's happening. Well, if you want to have a fair observation of whether somebody thinks Hillary Clinton is corrupt, you can't say she's corrupt in the question. That's, that's not going to fit. On a scale of one to five, do you think Hillary Clinton is corrupt or not? Something like that, right? Why? because you're giving them the option to respond honestly. You're trying to solicit what they think, not push an answer on them. Um, so wording bias comes up a lot. Or in the 50s, here's another example, a little subtler. Um, you ring, 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 you're interviewing somebody, right? Um, do you support traditional gender roles of women in the home or is it okay for women to work outside of the house? What did you just do? you pinged off the respondent with that word traditional. And now they're automatically associating tradition with being in the house. I know we do make that assumption, but truth be told, women have worked outside of the house pretty much, like, like in the house, is, it, that's an ambiguously traditional thing. It might have been true in the 50s for some women, but um, when you ping it off that way, you're corrupting the results that you're getting, okay? Um, so just these three kinds of different kinds of bias, really important and helpful for us. You know, you can play around online if you feel like it, go Google all the different types of bias that are out there. Um, there's, you know, a hundred different types of bias. Okay. Um, so that's it for today. Um, we've hit, um, uh, uh, all the, all the key things, um, the role of doubt, Theoretical pluralism, the three parts of science, multi-causality, it's a collective, not individual uh, endeavor, publicity, replicability, control for bias. These are the key things that we're trying to do with science. Um, and you know, you'll see all of this in every single discipline uh, that you that you will come across.